we at the Department of Film Studies, uh, which we, we call uh, in German uh, a short FIVI, um, we have been collecting films uh, basically since the inauguration of this department uh, more than 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, first, when we started that back uh, in, a, in another uh, century, uh, that was uh, done on VHS. And then, of course, we switched to DVD and Blu-ray later. And we now have a collection which roughly holds, uh, if we include uh, all the films which have not yet been catalogued, about 60,000 films. Uh, these are 60,000 films on roughly uh, 35,000 discs. And as far as I know, this kind of... There are, of course, many film archives with, with, much, more, with uh, much bigger collections, but this kind of like academically curated collection of DVDs and so on, I don't know of any bigger collection in Western Europe, uh, which doesn't mean it, it, that it doesn't exist, but it's certainly one of the biggest collections of, of its kind uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, of these 35,000 discs, about 10,000 are on self-burned DVDs. These are mainly films recorded from television, in other words, films which are not available on commercial uh, DVDs. Um, Martin will talk about these uh, later in more detail, and this collection continues to grow. And what do we do with, with these films? They are used in teaching on the one hand, in a normal course, we will always, uh, in every session, uh, watch, watch a movie. Um, the staff can lend the discs, so we have free access to them, uh, can use them for research or whatever. And students, they can also watch them. They can take them uh, home, but they can watch them uh, at our department. So we have uh, places where they can watch uh, the films. Here is a snapshot uh, of our collection. So you get uh, an idea of what this looks like. So these uh, are our treasures. Now, the problem we're facing is, and that's the, I'm sure it's something which you are all in one way or another familiar, because I guess most of you don't even have DVD players anymore, is that uh, DVD and Blu-rays, they have been declining for years. The number of releases every year has gotten smaller and smaller, and that's quite drastically. And many films which at one point have been released on DVD or Blu-ray, uh, have just be, been released once and will never be re-released again. This is something where we can be pretty sure of. And another fact is that optical storage has a limited shelf life. In other words, these discs don't hold forever. And Martin will talk about this then in, in more detail. So in other words, if we just continue the way we, we did uh, uh, for years, we will sooner or later lose large parts or uh, in the end our whole collection because these discs just don't uh, are not made for eternity so what are, are the possible alternatives um if we talk to someone who isn't really knowledgeable about uh, this stuff they will say yeah obviously we don't who need this anymore we have streaming everything is available uh, uh, just with, with a mouse click but this is obviously uh, not true um, if we look at uh, Netflix, and I'm just taking Netflix here as like a uh, pass for Toto for all the streaming services, what they offer, uh, their holdings are much smaller than what we have. Um, we have just been uh, beginning of the week to try to figure out how much uh, films uh, Netflix actually offers, and the numbers are not really clear, but it's really a fraction of what we have. And what's even more important, uh, these uh, collections are constantly fluctuating. You can be sure that a film which is available today on Netflix will also be available uh, in two weeks from now, which is, of course, for teaching an impossible situation. Just uh, on a side note, I mean, it's also impossible. I can't, uh, for if I teach a course on something, I can't expect my students to subscribe to three different streaming services so ju just that I can watch movies. So this obviously does not. Uh, and no one knows how long a specific film is available on a specific streaming services. Most uh, streaming services, or I would say probably all, also only um, in, um, uh, offer one version of a specific movie. So if you have some uh, historical uh, ver uh, film or, I don't know, some silent film where there are multiple versions, if it exists, it only exists in one version, version and most of the time 
It's not really clear what version that is. It's badly documented. So for any kind of serious historical research, that's just uh, a no-go. And uh, most importantly, probably, is that we only have streaming access, that we don't have access to the, to the actual file. And this is something we absolutely need. On the one hand, whenever I do a presentation, be it in, in class or for some other lecture, I will do uh, short uh, make short clips which I include in my presentation which is not doable if you only have access to streaming and if you actually look what is happening right now uh, in the humanities you have this uh, big uh, turn uh, towards uh, working with large corpuses of data with data mining with deep big data to do any kind of this uh, fancy stuff we need access to the uh, actual files uh, so Basically, any kind of future-oriented research is impossible if we don't have access to the files. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, this is not doable with the normal streaming services. So as a first a conclusion, um, if we don't do anything, we run the risk of losing our collection. Streaming services is, as I just explained, that there are no real alternative. And uh, it's also actually quite obvious that sooner or later, we have to leave physical storage behind us. I mean, our students today, most of them don't have a, a DVD or Blu-ray player. They don't even know how to use uh, this machinery. And it's, uh, and it's already become, when I started um, at university, uh, in every classroom we had a VHS player, later we, in every classroom we had a DVD player. Now, if we actually want to show a DVD in class, we have to bring our own players because the university does, doesn't provide the infrastructure anymore. So this is just something which is uh, on the way out. Uh, can, and, I, can I just add one thing to the DVD sure. problem? Of course, DVDs, they also have this region format. So as soon as you have an Asian DVD, you, you might be allowed to set your laptop to play it, but then it's set to that for always. And you can never again play a European or US or whatever. It, it, it's just a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for that. So um, what we are facing is a scenario where we don't have access to the very works which are the core of what we do. Uh, we are running the risk of losing everything we actually work with, which is really uh, quite concerning. And uh, the interesting thing is um, when I started on this project, which I, just, which I will just explain, it was like, okay, this is obviously a problem and it's a problem for film studies, but the more we worked on this, the more we became aware of actually, this does not just concern us, this concerns basically everybody uh, at a university or in academia who works with audiovisual material. So if you look at other departments, I don't know, a liter literature department or art history, they all have their small collections. They are not as big as our collections, but they all uh, have bought DVDs over the years uh, and they, they face the same problem sooner or later. So in the long run, it's actually quite clear there is no real alternative to taking our collection, put, um, ripping it, putting it uh, on a server and making it somehow uh, available. And this is what we've been working on for more or less the last year. Um, we call it uh, the Nobel original title, the Digital Film Library Project, and this is a joint project by the Department of Film Studies and the University Library Zurich. The reasons for this uh, cooperation and why the, the library is involved is, uh, is not really interesting. This has to do with some uh, organizational stuff, but these are like the two uh, bodies which are in this project. And besides uh, Martin and me, that's Philip Bronner, he's our video library guy. Uh, and then you have the Liara Frühauf, uh, who is a student assistant, uh, who's uh, doing a, a lot of uh, uh, important but boring work. Um, so what is our long-term goal? The long-term goal is ripping the whole collection and making it available online. And making it online with some kind of media access management system, um, and then an, a system which will uh, allow for fine-grained access management. The idea is very clearly not to make these films available to everybody, so that there we have some kind of a university-wide Netflix or something. The idea is very clearly only for students to make them available for specific films for specific courses. So if they um, uh, take course uh, blah, 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 and I don't know, uh, uh, on early uh, or in expressness uh, German silent movies, 
uh, they will just have access to the films shown uh, in the courts and they will only have access uh, for a limited uh, time. Uh, for, peop uh, for the staff of the department, they will probably have more or less uh, complete access. And of course, it will be interesting for external researchers. So if someone comes from outside saying, okay, you have this film, I need this, that uh, we would uh, grant access uh, to that research for that specific film. Um, this is like more on the uh, side of the actual uh, films. And another uh, aspect, uh, which is the part which I have been working on mostly is uh, that we um, want to uh, do, uh, make uh, the whole metadata available as linked open data. So in other words, that uh, we make this av data available and connect to other databases and repositories. I will talk about this uh, uh, in more detail uh, just in a moment. And uh, it was the idea once this infrastructure is set up that we make it available to other departments so that uh, the literature department I just spoke of or the art history department, they can also bring their uh, DVDs and we uh, uh, rip the stuff for them and make it available. So uh, what we are working on now, or we have like divided this in different sub projects, which are on very different levels. Um, so uh, the first sub project is uh, ripping the 10,000 self-burned DVDs. This is very pressing, a very pressing issue, as Martin will explain in a second. The second and probably most difficult task is clarify the legal situation. Um, uh, uh, again, I will talk about this uh, later. Uh, then evaluation of soft and hardware. How do we actually set this thing up? What do we need? How much will it cost? Uh, and so on. And finally, uh, modernizing the catalog to make this data available. Yeah. And with this, I'm, I hand over to Martin, who will talk about the nitty gritty stuff uh, of the uh, disks and so on. Um, yeah, I just talk about like the, the technical implementation. And just as a caveat, I'm a bit ill. So uh, bear with me, wild hairstyle and everything. And also, from the technical point of view, I was supposed to have two screens now and have one and all that, but we'll get through this. So, um, as Simon said, uh, we have about 10,000 DVD hours, which are those uh, you can burn yourself. And like all media, or all, all physical media, uh, it doesn't last forever. And uh, there have been done uh, tests, like how long do they actually last? And there, some people suggest it's 10 to 20 years. And the important thing is, uh, just like in, in, in film, like once it's not not like a linear going bad like if if after 10 years it goes a bit bad that means okay i have another 10 years it's like really very strongly um sorry my english is gone uh it, it's a steep curve <laughs> exactly but there's a even better word but anyway uh potential that's one and uh, so once the mistakes start coming, they, they DVDs degrade very quickly. So it's important to uh, migrate them. And uh, you might know like uh, as a physical medium, it, it has its limitations. So it, it, in this bit, they're a bit over a millimeter thick. Most of that is protection area and the actual information layer is just a thin, layer of aluminium and uh, so so the DVDs can get damaged in multiple ways. One of course is UV light, but they're, they're usually protected. Uh, then just by using it, they, they tend to get fingerprints, grease on it uh, that can be removed, but you can also get scratches on it. And if they're deeper, then they actually hurt the reflective layer. But also like on, on top, uh, as you can see here on, on one of our DVDs, uh, people used to write something on it. And those pigments over time, they, they enter the protective layer. And, and like if you use the wrong pen or you just wait long enough, then they will actually get into the reflective layer and start hurting uh, the data. And even worse is if people put uh, stickers on it, that actually adds two problems. One is the, the adhesive that can be quite aggressive and again, damage the media. And the other thing is, 
because the during ripping you you tend to spin the disc at high speed uh, when there's a sticker on it that can actually uh put put the 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 spinning disc out of order and they they become harder to read as well and lastly the uh like the placement of the data is not equal so depending on where the error is that can be more severe so uh, usually on, on the center part, you have the information of where is the actual information. And uh, if, if the center is damaged, then even though the data is still there, you can't find it anymore because you don't know what it is in a way. Um, so uh, basically we, we decided that, that our disk should be saved. And here, here's an image of one room full with uh, all the DVD-Rs. There are like roughly 10,000 of them. And uh, the the goal was to put all, this whole room into one single box. And of course, uh, like during COVID, we, we started getting, uh, like during COVID, we had to start uh, ripping single films just to, so we could continue uh, the normal education and, and, and research. So we had like some, some experience already how to do it, but we knew if we would rip by hand, that would take so much time and it would just be too expensive. So uh, we bought like a, a ready-made system, which is like a DVD ripping robot. And that basically can rip up to 500 uh, optical media at a time. And it just automatically takes them, puts them into uh, each reader, and saves them. And like it also does little things like it shakes it slightly so you don't get two at once. And if the DVD are in, in good order, then then you can do 500 every single day. And so we did a bit of calculation, like how much data will we produce? And then 10,000 DVDs, they can have a maximum of 4.7 4 gigabytes. So that would be about 50 tera. Uh, then we also wanted to encode them into like a streaming format to make them available easier via our network. But of course, we would always keep the uncompressed data. And then we also wanted to do backups on LTO uh, just in case the server crashes, there's a fire, whatever. So we, we store those LTOs in two different places. So even if the whole building burns down, uh, it's still saved. So there's a total of 160 terabyte and uh, we build a server for that. And uh, of course there were costs involved and we had a, a, a limit of 20,000 and that we spent uh, on the robot itself uh, that includes the, the special ripping software and uh, PC that was about 8,000. Then the server that was a Synology station, that's a bit over 2000 a drive for LTO. That's actually quite expensive, but that lasts a long time and can also be used in the future. Then the LTOs at 1200 and the transcoding PC at 2500. And uh, the idea was also we knew in the future we would want to rip more. And uh, so the only future costs would be more server space. Because mm -hmm. and, and LTO tapes, but but like the big expenses have already been shouldered, so um, we're good to go for the future. And uh, then also the idea was how long would this take ideally, and if we can rip uh, five hundred DVDs a day, uh, it takes about two hours to to make them ready. Just taking them out of the cover, putting them in order, taking them in, and then of course afterwards removing them again. So uh, with a bit of safety, that means two thousands per week. So after five weeks, we should have been able to rip all the DVDs. After that, re-encoding to H.264 and uh, packing it all up. So uh, that would should take about three months to to get the whole room into the box. And that is like if everything is perfect, but of course life never is. Um, so now we have ripped all of them, but it took long a time. Uh, one thing was just uh, human time because uh, I have only 20% for this project. So I could come in like twice a week. Uh, and sometimes I was away 
business travel, whatever. So it took longer, but in theory, it, it could have been done in in three weeks, uh, three months. And then there are some learnings from what we've done so far. And as always, things are way more complicated. They take longer time. And of course, there are legal issues involved. And um, what takes longer? So what's really important is preparing the media. And uh, because the uh, ripping software that uh, the only information it takes is the volume name of the DVD and uh, most DVDs, they don't have it or often they are wrong. Um, and then we can just number it sequentially. But of course, if something happens during the ripping, uh, then the order comes out of whack. Or if a DVD is missing, because in our case, uh, that was a room where, where people would still borrow discs. So sometimes they just went there, some were damaged. And uh, really every time something is out of sync, that is really what takes a lot of time figuring out afterwards in the in the sequely numbered DVDs files, which is actually which one. Um, then uh, on, on our DVD ask that worked fine, but as a test project I also took 500 media from the East Asian studies and they were much more mixed. And, and the main problem was uh, all DVDs, they had like a little sticker in, in the center. And remember, uh, center is not a good place. Uh, but all the data was readable. But the problem was when you stacked the DVDs in the DVD robot, they would stick to each other. So every time the robot wanted to pick one up and try to shake it, uh, they would keep sticking or both of them would fall because they would stick so well together. So rather than me just stacking 500, leaving for the day, I had to sit there the whole time and, and watch that every single DVD would be picked up. So that that took way more time. Um, of course, some, some DVDs are damaged. Usually that can be fixed just by cleaning it manually. But we also bought uh, like a special cleaning machine that has a special solution that does really very fine grinding of, of the surface. So usually it would help just cleaning it 30 seconds in that one. On, on, on a few DVDs, we had to run, uh, run, run it for a few minutes. And uh, in the end of, of the 10,000 DVDs, we had about 30 DVDs that aren't readable yet, or that, that are only partially readable. And uh, there we basically have to see how important are those films? Uh, should we spend more time on it? Because we could, of course, clean it more. We could do uh, what is called DD Rescue. There's a program that reads every single byte and tries to save as much as it can. But that takes about like it can take up to a week for one single DVD to get as much data out as possible. Um, so that that's a future decision to make from our librarian to see is is it worth the effort. And then, of course, uh, not on our DVD hours, but on on. Uh, commercial media, they have different types of copy protections. And the robot software, of course, doesn't allow copy protected software. So uh, removal of uh, copy protection, uh, which by the way, is allowed under Swiss law. So uh, that's why we could do it. Uh, so we had to get a third party plugin that removes most of the commercial protections. And in those few cases where it didn't, then there was uh, always uh, make MKV that's a shareware software that that pretty, pretty much takes care of all the copyright things, but they of course have to be ripped manually. So things take longer. And then of course, there's the fun of the legal part, as Simon said, uh, that's a big headache. Uh, first of all, it's complicated. So there, if you ask, like Simon likes to say, if you ask five lawyers, you get 10 different answers and none of them will say, uh, it will not work and none of them will say it will work. They just tell you about the problems and lawyers never like problems. And uh, so uh, in the end, it will mean we have to pay something, but it's uncertain how much and also to whom. Uh, current law is uh, first, we have to get the permission from the rights holder. And in each case, we, we would have to make an agreement with every single rights holder with uh, 30,000 DVDs, uh, 
and just one librarian that would uh, keep him busy for the next few lifetimes. So uh, it, it's it's not doable for, for anyone. And uh, what we do for now is that we say all the migration is done for preservation only. So, so no one has access to the ripped films. It's just so we have them. Because as, as, uh, as our lawyer said, uh, we're only allowed to make copies if the films are no longer commercial available and if our DVDs no longer work, which is like a catch-22 because by the time you are allowed to do a copy, you, you cannot make a copy anymore. So we have to do uh, preventive uh, backups, basically. Yeah, and, and that also leads me to just a little uh, call for action. It, it's like for the future of, of research and education, it's really important that we find a solution to this legal headache because um, right now, it means uh, teaching becomes more difficult, research becomes more difficult, but in the future there's, uh, like I, I, I've just been to the uh, FIAF conference and there's a lot of uh, happening in the research, how you can use uh, AI to analyze big bodies of work and you can do uh, very complicated analysis. Like for example, how has the role of female uh, voices in, advertisements changed the last 50 years and no single person can watch all ads or all science fiction films uh, that ever have been made but ki can do, uh, ai can do that uh, but right now we're not allowed to do it so uh, to really have a future in research and and move it into the 21st century we need to be allowed to to do something with that and with that we can move on to the q and a just uh, if we look at these uh, four sub-projects, as Martin just told us, uh, the first uh, this step is done, so the really immediate threat, so to speak, uh, is uh, is banned. And as Martin already indicated, the legal situation, that's a big headache. When when we start this project, I had the naive idea, yeah, we can do this some kind of somehow on the radar, and no one really cares. Uh, and it turned out that this is not the way to go. And we are currently negotiate we're talking to different groups because we are not the only one who have this problem basically i mean uh, they're basically all the schools in switzerland more or less have the same problem and i guess it's the same uh, uh, everywhere because they have all bought dvds which they can't do anything uh, with them anymore so things are there are different levels of negotiation uh, going on but in the end it will boil down to that we will come uh, with a uh, suggestion to the um, head of the university saying this is what we want to do this is the risks uh, as far as we can say do we do we want to proceed here or not it's an ultimate decision which it's not up to us which is really up to the uh, uh, university um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, leadership I mean one question is and this is not something no one can answer is at least in theory we are not really hurting anyone uh, because we we have a huge collection, but if you actually look how many of these films we would use or show to students, uh, we will be talk about a few hundred films which will be shown to a few hundred students every year. So it's actually really, it's a tiny, tiny uh, amount of films. And I think no one can actually really argue sensibly that uh, anyone is losing money because of that. We are not uh, in any way um, a threat for a commercial uh, a film distributor. But this is of course not a, le not a legal, not an argument which we hold in court, uh, which is the problem. So this is something which is going on. Um, evaluation of hardened software. When we started this project, I thought this was the main thing we, get to, we had to do. Uh, and uh, uh, as, it, as we realize now, until we haven't solved the legal uh, uh, question at least halfway, uh, we had, don't have to, uh, uh, care about this so basically this is uh, postponed or stalled for the moment so uh, the other thing uh, which uh, we're working on now or which i've been working on is modernizing the catalog uh, and now uh, comes the nerdy stuff um, uh, we have our whole collection is cataloged with a file maker database you see this uh, uh, on the left uh, very few people actually ha um, have access to that. Uh, basically, it's a handful of people. The most of the people they see it, what you see on the right, uh, this is uh, 
the a web interface. So the whole catalog is available uh, uh, on the web. Uh, and this catalog, um, this uh, is the same catalog or an extension of the catalog that was built more than 30 years ago. So this has been growing and growing. And this is a completely proprietary solution. And originally this was a completely flat database where every film had its own entry. What I mean by this is the entries were not linked. It was not a relative database. So if you had one film entry, you couldn't from that entry go, for example, to the director and then to other films by that director, or you wouldn't have, you wouldn't know if there were different versions of a film. We didn't use any standardized identifiers and no standardized interface for data exchange. There's no API or anything. And I'm sure many of you are aware of, uh, uh, of these FAIR principles, which are a big thing currently uh, in research. So how you should uh, make research data available, it should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And basically, originally our catalog failed more or less on all of these accounts. Maybe findable uh, and partly accessible, but everything else uh, uh, um, we didn't uh, adhere to this. So one sub project uh, is called FIVI on, which stands for FIVI ontology. This has been funded by a research grant by Swiss universities, which is like the um, uh, uh, association of all Swiss universities. And the goal is modernizing the catalog, adopting fair principles, as I just explained, implement standardized identifiers, and then using them for data enrichment. Because once you use the standard identifiers, you can suddenly, for example, via Wikidata, get all kinds of additional data. And adopt uh, what is called a VEMI logic or WEMI logic. So I'm not sure uh, who of you is, uh, is uh, aware of this. What this means is, uh, is it's also in the world of library, it's also called an FRBR ontology, which means functional requirements for bibliographic, bibliographic records. What it basically means is that we, when we talk about, this comes from the world of libraries, but then when we talk about films, that we have different levels of, of abstraction. First, we have the work, the film as such. And for the uh, uh, example I choose here is Blade Runner for specific reasons. So we have Blade Runner. Now for Blade Runner, there are several versions. Uh, in Vemi, it's called expressions, but actually for reasons I will not go into in the world of film, uh, variation makes more sense. But in the case of Blade Runner, there was the original theatrical release, then there was later the director's cut, and there was the final cut. There was actually also a preview cut. So there are at least, uh, uh, depending on how you count it, five to seven different versions, uh, and they uh, should be uh, uh, distinguished. Now, of these uh, expressions here or variations, there are different releases. For example, there is of the director's cut a release in 2007 as DVD by Warner Brothers. And then there's the item. That's the actual physical item we have in our library, which has a signature D24756. So we have a different level of abstractions and uh, it's important if you actually want to really know what we have and what different versions of it we have that we uh, take account of this. Um, another important issue is identifiers. Uh, and here uh, there are um, a bunch of uh, um, uh, common identifiers when it comes to film. Uh, and I will just quickly go uh, through these. Uh, if you want more details, I will gladly uh, uh, give them. So this is going to be uh, rather quick. The one I which sure most of you have heard of, or basically everyone, is the Internet Movie Database, which is the biggest database for film is by far the most co comprehensive, but the problem is this is a commercial company, it's closed. There's no freely available a API. Uh, if you want to actually have access uh, to, uh, to the database to really do automated searches, uh, it's so expensive that when I wrote them an email, the answer was basically, you cannot afford that. You cannot afford that. We will not give you a, 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 any numbers. Um, so uh, another one is the movie database is not as comprehensive as uh, IMDb, but it's open, community built, free, and offers very powerful, freely available API. And it offers a lot of structured data, meaning if you know the name of the director, you can, or the identifier of the director, you can get all his films, uh, and from there, uh, go forth. Um, 
Wikidata, which is the foundation behind Wikipedia, is again less comprehensive than movie database, but is completely free and open, has a very powerful API, uh, uh, at least uh, to my case, it's almost uh, too powerful, um, and offers highly structured data. Um, if you actually, uh, if a film has a Wikidata identifier, this is the place where you get most uh, data, where you can do most of data enrichment. So if you, uh, if I have a, a, a ID for a film, I can get the name of the director, I can get the biography of the director, I can get the photography of the director, and so on and so on. Um, another one important is either. Um, this is uh, in scope comparable to the movie database. It's part of the DOI system. So it means it's part of a standardized system which we use uh, in academia anyway. And it also offers a powerful API. It's members only, but uh, you can get the free membership uh, at least uh, if you're an academic institution, uh, that's not complicated. Problem here is the, the data is not uh, uh, structured. So the most data you get is just free text. Then you, the data is not linked. The, 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 the various entries are, are not linked among uh, uh, between the, them. But by either, it's very important for us is that this is the own identifier which differentiates between work and expression. So if you have a film like Blade Runner, there is an ID for the work, for the abstracted work, and there are IDs for the different variations, which is very important for us. And the last, which I'm only uh, mentioning for completeness reason, is, is ESAM. is an ESO standard, which would, um, that sounds it makes interesting, but it's the least comprehensive. It's for paying members only. I, for the moment, we have a free test membership. And to my um, big surprise, the API turned out to be really unreliable. I often get wrong results for reasons I don't understand. So I've been tinkering with this stuff uh, during the last year or something. And when I started this, uh, my idea was, okay, I just, um, just play around with it. Uh, to do that properly, we need a proper pro uh, programmer to do this. But it turned out that it was actually, even with my limited scripting skills, I was very successful. So this is the status from uh, yesterday morning. Um, as you can see, um, uh, so this is a roughly 57,500 uh, records and the vast majority we have been able to attach identifiers to. And there's only about 13% of films which I so far was unable to attach an identifier. And there are sure some um, films there where identifiers exist, but I would say the the vast majority of these films with identifiers, they just simply don't exist in any database, be it because there's some exotic, um, I don't know, avant-garde short film, or uh, we also have in our catalog often bonus material on DVDs, which are, just don't exist in any database so far. But uh, since we are an IDA member, is the idea that sooner or later, all the content we have in our database which at the moment is not yet um, in either will be added sooner or later. So in the not to distant future, basically everything should uh, have uh, identifiers. And I will now do a very quick demo uh, to show you what this uh, actually uh, allows us uh, uh, to do. Uh, hold on a second. Okay, so I'm sharing this again. So. Uh, what you see here is the web interface uh, uh, of our catalog. Uh, and uh, just an example, I'm searching here for a very famous movie, a Battleship uh, uh, Potemkin. Uh, and I search for this. Uh, here we have the various results. And now the interesting thing is, if I go on detail, um, for one, I get here all the title variations and uh, these type variations, they uh, most of them are actually taken uh, from other databases. And since uh, this film now has a unique identifier uh, uh, and also different versions of identifiers, uh, we can now show all the versions that the weiter Zyperversion means uh, other available versions in our uh, collections. So through the identifier, we, we can show all the available versions of this film. This was something which was not possible uh, before uh, we added the identifiers. We also have uh, many external links, so I can go uh, to uh, uh, other websites which have uh, this information. 
And uh, since this is all now all linked data, I can also go through the director. And as I said, we have now, this comes from Wikidata, we have uh, a portrait, we have alternative names, which in the case of Eisenstein is very, very extensive. Uh, there are <laughs> very many variations. This is, again, this is information which no one has entered by hand. This is information which has been uh, uh, gathered um, automatically by uh, various uh, databases. Here we have all the films in the database. And what's especially interesting, we have a special category in our catalog of film historical documentation. So documentary films about films. And there, uh, if a director is named, uh, is important in that film, he's also uh, uh, in the catalog. And this allows us now, these are all films, documentaries, about Eisenstein in our collection. Again, this is only possible because we did all this uh, identifier stuff and this data enrichment. So this just very quickly um, of uh, what we are able uh, to do here. Uh, and uh, hold on a second. Uh, somehow I don't see where I can stop the sharing. Ah, here, okay. So, so that's uh, for it for the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I didn't know there was a, a second part to figure yeah, out. Sure. <laughs> um, I'll skip my question then because we do have some in the chat and I'm gonna start at the ones that came in the soonest um, and work a uh, way down. So the first question we have is from uh, fellow European Tech Community Manager, uh, Antoine. Yes. Uh, are there ways to share this kind of robot so that other institutions mm. interesting, interested in doing this could save on some costs? I mean, the, the funny thing is, also in this presentation, this question comes up. <laughs> so everyone loves, uh, loves our robot. I would say, in theory, yes, we haven't really figured out this yet. I mean, the thing is, uh, when the robot is not in use, it's not in use, so there's nothing speaking against lending it. But... Yeah, I mean, I'd maybe Martin, you, you you can add to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I would wait until we have ripped everything because <laughs> it, it is a physical medium and uh, things wear wear out. And for example, we had uh, when we started the the actual pickup arm had a problem, so that needed to be replaced. And of course, uh, we'd hate it if we finally get to to rip our films and then the robot doesn't work for some reasons. But um, I, I don't, I can't say yes, but I don't say no. <laughs> I think that's the best answer we can give yeah. right now. But uh, those machines, they are 8,000, including everything. Um, so if we can't do it, then, then maybe if your institution needs one for some, just get together with some other institutions and then if four share, then it's 2,000 mm. and that should be doable. I, I mean... The plan is at the moment also not, not yet decided that uh, uh, finally decided that we will also start ripping the rest of our collection uh, with copy protection and so on. This will take, I'm quite sure, much longer because there will all kind of uh, problems uh, which we are not aware of yet, and just because the ripping copy protection takes longer. But in principle, I don't know. It's fair to say that I don't know. In a year from now, basically this is done, uh, more, more or less, and. The moment we have gone through the the whole collection, we don't really need the robot uh, anymore, or at least not immediately. So this is certainly something which we uh, uh, which is uh, yeah, which is a possibility. But, I mean, well, if, if someone well, needs it right now, probably not. <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, we we will soon start offering the service university wide. Uh, and that's also why why we did the test project with the one department just to see how does it work and realizing how much more time it takes when it isn't so well ordered as it was in in the Phoebe. Um, just there's a good question that kind of, that taps off of that uh, from Peter um, that you had already done um, storage work of moving stuff to VHS and from VHS to DVD. Is the plan also then to digitize those DVDs that were you you were already kind of using as a, a backup from the VHSs? Um, I mean, they haven't already been. 
Yeah. And, and, and actually, ju just as a nomenclature, it, it's uh, migrating because digitizing means turning something. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. But I know everyone calls it digitizing, just as everyone yeah. says you restore films, uh, yeah. even though you really don't. But <laughs> I mean, uh, basically, what we did when we switched from VHS to DVD is that we did a very thorough examination at that time which of the films on v we had on VHS were av available on commercial DVDs. So uh, everything that was av available on DVD at that time was bought and uh, uh, and only the VHS uh, which contained stuff which was never available on DVD at that time was then, uh, that was digitized and then uh, uh, burned uh, uh, on DVDs. But the total, total small fraction and these VHS tapes, they don't exist anymore. Uh, 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 and I mean, in the meantime, we never did a full like re-evaluation. Uh, I'm pretty sure that at least parts of the, no, I know that parts of the uh, DVD-Rs actually contain stuff which today is available uh, on commercial DVDs. Um, but most of the stuff, uh, the majority is just things which, as I said, have once been recorded on, uh, uh, on TV. We also later, uh, when we were on, on um, when we already had uh, everything on DVD, we still would record stuff from uh, from TV on DVD, stuff which just isn't available uh, anywhere else or wasn't available anywhere else. And, and also many of those recordings on DVD are, they were taken off the television where we at that time had a license to do. And some of them might be different versions than the commercially available ones. And then of course we could use uh, AI to, to analyze those films and see other differences rather than getting some students to spend the summer on comparing all those films. Mm -hmm. And and then we could decide, is it worth keeping them? And and of course I come from a preservation background, so I don't like just uh, throwing things away. They need something to do in the summer. Um, <laughs> question, There's enough qu other stuff to be done. <laughs> question, question from Robert Pritchard from the BFI. Um, you mentioned making two backups on LTO. And do you also have fail safes that are off site? Uh, and yeah, uh, for multiple locations. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's basically our our, our like um, they're on the server which has double redundancy. So if two disks out of the six fail, uh, we still don't lose a single byte. Um, so that is pretty safe. So the the next danger would be. Uh, the house burning down or someone stealing the server or whatever. And then we have LTOs uh, soon in two, two different locations. Right now we're, we're still making those actual copies, but um, it, it, in the end, it will be in, in two locations. And then unless Hall of Zurich vanishes, um, those are saved and then we have different problems anyway. So, but, <laughs> is about the answer. Yeah. Uh, another question from Annie, Annie Shaw, also from the BFI. And uh, Simon, you, I guess, were talking about in the second half of your presentation, uh, if I was understanding correctly, um, what kind of uh, every country has their different uh, exemptions within the copyright law? And um, could you explain more about which ones you're um, utilizing um, or maybe have the potential to mm -hmm. um, utilize in the future? I mean, the the interesting or a little bit absurd uh, thing is, as far as I know, you are allowed to show a commercially bought film in class. So if you buy a DVD, you can show that in class, which I think, for example, is not something you are allowed uh, in the same way in Germany. You can show that, but you are. And, and there's also, uh, you are out there, copy for private use. So if I bought the DVD, I can make a copy and give it uh, to Martin. If uh, uh, I am, what I'm not allowed is in an educational context to make a copy of that DVD, which makes no sense at all, but is the legal state at the moment. I'm not really sure whether this, this is uh, on, uh, on purpose or by accident, but the fact is that there is a hole there and the, uh, which is a problem. As Martin said, once you say I'm doing an archival copy, then the situation is, 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 is different again. And interesting enough, um, the 
the copyright law has uh, just recently been uh, revised and in uh, Switzerland is very modern and so on, they actually uh, added a clause that you are allowed to do copying if it's just for big data research. So that means actually just to make it, ava to make it available to then uh, have some AI going through it, that would be possible, but it wouldn't be, still be, don't, wouldn't be allowed to show this stuff uh, in class. So there really is something in, in, in missing there. Uh, that's the legal situation uh, as far as I understand it. I'm a lawyer and to be honest, uh, we have a lawyer in our team uh, from the university library. Uh, uh, that's, what, that's her interpretation and also other, other interpretations. Um, but I think what I already mentioned, but it, in the end, it also boils, that boils down to what risk is the university ready to take? Because in the end, you can never, you can never make sure that, not so, that someone will not sue you, no matter what you do. Uh, and the question is, uh, how big is the risk of getting sued? And is the university uh, ready to, yeah, to take that risk? We're gonna get to the the last question here. I saw there's also um so there's also been some resources posted um from the European uh, copyright community who are having a meetup uh, next next week on the fourteenth. Um so and it will be about audiovisual uh, work specifically and also for educators. So mm -hmm. a continuation of what um yeah what Annie asked. Annie was also the one who shared it. Um, and also some details from Yuha about how they've done the work in Finland um, and that they already noticed problems within five years uh, with discs that are only five years old. Um, so the last question here is from uh, Fra Frank Linnebach. And uh, what possibilities exist to be able to search within the, uh, within the films? Um, and I guess if I'm understanding that correctly, for instance, the Tana Vision uh, we have markers, you're able to scrub through things, you're able to jump from scenes to scenes, you're even able to jump from um, certain speakers or facial recognition mm -hmm. or voice recognition. What kind of um, kind of tools exist for researchers at the, the university? And at the moment, no, no. because we're not allowed to, to oh, show. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's the catch. I mean, we, we can do it, but we, we are not allowed to. I mean, at the moment, uh, uh, just to make that clear, the, for also from these 10,000 discs, what we have are just the ISO images. Uh, this, uh, we don't have at the moment uh, individual files for individual films. This is a pipeline marking is currently setting up, which will be the next step. But of course, the next to next step would then be to make that stuff available. And we're actually, uh, I'm involved in several projects uh, also with the people from the linguistics department where we are actually looking exactly into this kind of stuff. How can we make this uh, automatically searchable and so on? So this is, I mean, this is a very hot topic, but uh, at the moment it's a bit, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we're just not there yet. It, it's also the, the Swiss broadcaster, their technical arm called SRG. They, they had an interesting presentation now at the FIAF conference where they used a pre-trained language model and uh, gave that one all their uh, documentary footage that they had, where often they wouldn't know what's on, on the tape. And then they uh, basically could ask the question, oh, show me all scenes where tractor in the autumn is on a field. And uh, they get about like 50% hit quote, which is amazing because before they, they wouldn't know what they had. And uh, so so that, that there's a huge commercial interest in, in, in getting uh, AIs that, that can search huge uh, database or huge amounts of, of video data and, and, and get the content. And uh, we've only scratched the surface. And, and yeah. again, that's why it's so important that we're allowed to do something with it because that is where, where research is heading in, in, in the future. Yeah, and uh, quite, like to look at it from the other way, whenever I talk to people who are in this field and I mention our collection, they, they, their eyes get very big because we have a rather unique corpus here because it's, it's really huge and it's already all digital to so actually 
making this stuff available for this kind of research would be re relatively easy. Uh, and I mean, it costs some money, but in, in the end, the uh, um, storage space is cheap. That's, uh, that's, that's all doable. And I mean, I'm actually, at the moment, I'm quite positive that we will come to some agreement uh, with, uh, with the rights holder in one way or another, uh, or that we will just uh, press forward. But uh, yeah, yeah, we are just not there yet. Yeah, and and also like uh, it's it's not just interesting material for for uh, film studies, but for example, uh, info uh, IT departments for for uh, visual for like for training database or training data set for for KI that is very interesting, or for psychology students or for art. It it's like basically most departments could or there are use cases for 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 many departments that could have benefit. Uh, if if they were allowed to use our material, I also saw that Andre he he had a question about uh, that we're allowed to rip copyright protected DVD. The thing is, uh, in Switzerland, you are allowed to remove uh, uh, protections from material that you have uh, bought as as a private person. So so. Uh, the act of removing a copyright is not illegal. It, it, but it, it's actually it's actually more complicated. But, uh, yeah, it's always yeah. In the end, you 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 can do it. The the, the thing is the the law says if there is uh, uh, like something if there is a function in copy protection, uh, removing that is the uh, is uh, illegal. But since there is already a tool available which uh, removes that protection. You can argue that this is not a functioning protection mechanism anymore. So you have a catch-22 which goes the other way around. But basically it means for private use, it's no problem uh, uh, to, to do that. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, it is complicated. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the thing is that, I mean, this whole uh, copy this making the removal of copy protection illegal, this is all part of this WIPO agreement uh, and this was made at a time when all the right holders were extremely scared and they introduced uh, something into the law, which was a purely technical thing, which doesn't make any sense actually on the legal ground. But basically every lawyer I talked to uh, said this, this law was made by people who don't know anything about the law because it's something very specific technically, but not, it, doesn't, it doesn't argue in legal terms, uh, which is why this law doesn't make any sense uh, in, in any way. <laughs> And also see Radoslav, he asked about the VHS digitization. Yeah, that was I have to, uh, but I have to, okay. I do have to go yeah. and, um, okay. and it's past 12 o'clock. So, uh, well, for the next time. Okay. If you have any questions, okay. email us or find us on LinkedIn. Yeah. The uh, University of Zurich website, film department studies, uh, yeah. uh, film studies department is behind us there. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Thanks for hosting us. Thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks uh, for listening to us. Copyright, copyright meeting uh, the 14th. You should go to that too. Bye.